All right. I am Dr. Marcus Ettinger, and everything you are about to hear is not medical advice. This is merely uh, edutainment. I'm going to be going over long COVID, some strategies, theories behind it, what it's all about, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, I am going to share the screen here. All right, just to give a little background, because we're going to touch on uh, the vagus nerve and serotonin, I'm going to go down this list to familiarize everybody what vagus nerve does or low vagal tone is about and what decreased serotonin levels, what a person could expect. So the vagus nerve is the 10th nerve, the cranial nerve. It exits the brain. It controls pretty much everything from throat down to the pelvis, digestive functions, um, heart, lungs, ovaries, testicles, and feedback from the world around us to the brain. So it's basically one of our biggest connections to the world around us to the brain. So basically everything from temperature, barometric pressure, how what is in our stomach, how we're feeling, mood, our surroundings, 80 to 85% of that nerve is sending what's called afferent or directed to the brain information to the brain and sending 15 to 20% of the information back down to the body, telling the body how to respond to it. So you can see how more important it is for that nerve to be able to experience everything that's going on within us and around us so the brain could adequately uh, tell it what to do and respond instantaneously in millions and billions of a second. So low vagal tone can affect can create digestive problems, poor digestion, bloating, constipation, IBS, subcategories, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, and irritable bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. Heart rate and blood pressure irregularities, so for instance, bradycardia, slow heart rate, arrhythmias, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, so basically getting up from a seated or lying position too quickly, the body can't respond because of that low vagal tone. The person gets altered heart rates and may even feel faint or pass out. And it contributes to fluctuation in blood pressure. Difficulty relaxing, low vagal tone may result in heightened stress responses, for instance, fight flight response or chronic fight right flight response. Uh, and it can even lead to symptoms of anxiety and chronic stress while at the same time causing difficulty in relaxing, rest and digest. So sleep and all digestive processes. Impaired immune function, low tone may weaken the immune system's ability to respond effectively to infection, depression, and imbalanced vagal tone can be associated with symptoms of depression and mood disorders, difficulty concentrating. So vagal tone affects cognitive processes and low tone may lead to difficulties in concentration and focus, as well as causing brain fog and memory impairment. Now, a lot of this will sound similar to decreased serotonin levels because they do go hand in hand. Vagal tone does respond to the levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin. So decreased serotonin levels uh, can lead to depression. Low serotonin levels are strongly associated with depressive symptoms, including low mood, lack of interest in activities, and feeling of hopelessness. Uh, anxiety and irritability, serotonin is involved in mood regulation and decreased levels can lead to anxiety symptoms such as excessive worry and restlessness. Sleep disturbances because serotonin is the direct precursor to melatonin, so low levels can result in sleep disturbances such as insomnia and poor sleep quality. Uh, appetite and weight changes, serotonin influences appetite and satiety low levels may lead to changes in appetite, potentially resulting in weight loss or gain. Pain sensitivity. Serotonin plays a role in pain modulation and low levels can result in increased pain sensitivity. Remember, we're talking about long COVID here. So all of these things 
people with long COVID, they don't have to have all of them, but they will experience um, one or more of these. And some people, some of my patients even experience uh, the majority of them. So gastrointestinal tract symptoms, serotonin in the gut affects digestive function. Low serotonin levels may lead to gastrointestinal tract issues, gut inflammation, nausea, and diarrhea due to increased fluid and motility in the gut. Cognitive impairment, low serotonin levels can impact cognition function, cognitive function resulting in difficulties with memory and decision making. Uh, vascular health, serotonin helps regulate blood vessel tone. It can influence the dilation and constriction of, constriction of blood vessels. When serotonin levels are low, it may lead to changes in vascular tone and potentially affect blood flow. Um, Platelet function, serotonin is stored in platelets, and when platelets are activated, they release serotonin. The serotonin release can enhance platelet aggregation, so clotting, which is a necessary step in formation of blood clots, but when it is chronically uh, activated or there is dysregulation in this function, those clots could then affect uh, other areas of the body. So cardiovascular system, deep vein thrombosis in the lower limbs, and even microscopic clots throughout the body. Vasoconstriction. So serotonin has vasoconstrictive effects, meaning it cause blood vessels to narrow. While this effect is essential for controlling bleeding after injury, abnormally low serotonin levels may impact the body's ability to constrict blood uh, vessels effectively. All right. So we have that. And now let's get into the meat and potatoes. So all of the three uh, journals I'll be going over have just come out within the last week to two weeks at the latest. So fortuitous that they all came out in the same time. So I could have gone through others, but I'm just gonna link these together and just highlight some of the things. Now this one is one of the first studies that I have seen that has showed the complete downstream effects from viral response to the final, uh, uh, how it affects the all the way downstream to the vagus nerve. So serotonin's reduction in post-acute sequelae of viral infections, which post-acute sequelae is the medical term for just long COVID. So in a nutshell, the virus comes in, the virus triggers an innate immune response. This is interferon alpha. The interferon then affects the enterocytes and endochromaphorum cells within the intestinal tract. It inhibits the body's absorption and utilization of the amino acid tryptophan, which then converts to 5-hydroxy tryptophan, which then converts to serotonin, which then leads to melatonin. This is affecting the platelets peripheral storage of serotonin because since there is no direct absorption or in, uh, inhibited absorption of tryptophan, there's going to be less serotonin that the platelets could carry. There's also gonna be disruption of the platelets that is creating this hypercoagulation. The, and I'm gonna get into what the journal says deeper, I'm just summarizing everything. Since there is reduced peripheral concentration of serotonin, then the vagus nerve then is affected. There are 5-hydroxytryptophan receptors, and along with disruption there and the decreased serotonin, vagus nerve is affected, which then basically is, is, can affect everything from the neck to the pelvis as well as neurocognitive effects, which are affecting mood as well as memory. So this one diagram shows the entire uh, processes. Now I'm just gonna read some highlights along the way, and that way that'll add a little bit more detail to this. So post viral symptoms, syndromes arise in a subset of individuals and can persist for months to years after disease onset. Now in my practice, I'm seeing anywhere between four out of 10, maybe even five out of 10 of my patients exhibiting some long COVID symptoms. And these patients will date back to onset anywhere in 2020, March or all the way to, uh, to uh, December of 2020. And then even 
those are the long, long COVID, but I do have uh, more recent patients and people are, my patients are still uh, coming down with COVID. I just had a patient today who is just getting over COVID and this was his first follow-up appointment since COVID just a few weeks back. Uh, several hypotheses have been proposed to explain the persistence of symptoms, including the presence of a viral reservoir. So showing that the viral virus does persist within the gastrointestinal tract that is not cleared after initial infection, chronic inflammation, autoantibody development. So this is, this is how uh, autoimmune diseases can take place. Chronic inflammation leading to, to chronic oxidative stress in the body, then the body reacts to its own tissues by creating autoantibodies, and it could be to any connective tissue or organ. Uh, so autoantibody development, tissue damage as a result of non-resolving uh, antiviral responses. Another common feature has been associated with post-viral symptoms is platelet dysfunction and hypercoagulation coagulability. This I'm seeing a lot. I'm seeing patients get uh, uh, clots in their lungs as well as deep vein thrombosis. I've been in practice 34 and a half, little, almost 35 years. I rarely saw this pre-2020 and I am probably seeing one patient every two months coming in who had to go to the emergency room due to uh, deep vein thrombosis in the calf as well as then presenting with it in other areas of the body. Finally, long COVID and other post-viral symptoms have been linked to autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So that's the vagus nerve. Again, controlling everything from throat down to the pelvis. So affecting hormones, digestion, uh, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, heart, lung, spleen, thyroid, parotid gland, all of that being affected, including the active branch going to the larynx and then people noticing that their voice now is softer and a little more crackly because that tone is low and it's actually affecting the larynx. Uh, using a combination of human cohort studies, animal models and viral infection and organoid cultures, we determined that the presence of viral RNA and downstream interferon responses causes a decrease in serotonin. Several mechanisms account for this phenomenon, including diminished uptake, of serotonin precursor tryptophan in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, reduced storage in the platelets due to thrombocytopenia, which just means lowered levels of platelets in the body, and enhanced turnover by serotonin uh, metabolizing enzymes called monoamine oxidase, which basically breaks down serotonin. One important consequence of peripheral serotonin deficiency is reduced activity of the vagus nerve, which in turn is associated with hippocampal dysfunction and memory loss. So the hippocampus is where we create uh, memory, spatial recognition, things like that. So brain fog and uh, memory issues. So viral inflammation decreases plasma serotonin levels. Several studies indicate the viral persistence might be a characteristic of long COVID, so the viral reservoir in the gut. Keeping, the, keeping COVID, they're, they're thinking eight months even longer of just COVID just being persistent in the system. Viral inflammation blocks intestinal tryptophan uptake. Viral inflammation impairs serotonin storage in the platelets, as well as uh, rapidly de being degraded by increased levels of monoamine oxidase enzyme, MAO. And then now this is leading to, where am I at here? Um, about the platelets. And, and this is an important issue with, with long COVID. So consistently, platelet aggregation was markedly enhanced. Prothrombin time and partial thromboplastin time, how we measure the ability of the body to clot was reduced. So it's in further indicative of hypercoagulatability. Uh, collectively, these results indicate that viral inflammation drives platelet hyperactivation, resulting in uh, hypercoagulability and thrombocytopenia and in an uh, interferon dependent manner. So as that diminished and that diminishes when the inflammation diminishes and the viral load diminishes, consequently we get uh, platelet mediated systemic 
uh, serotonin transport is impaired because as long as that uh, interferon is locked in the on position because it's part of the innate, it's, it's innate immune system. It's, it's our first short term uh, defense against viral bacterial uh, yeast fungus, but, and that is not supposed to go on for a long period of time. It gets enhanced by another part of the innate immune system called the uh, complement immune system. So it's complementing this uh, initial response, but these, this inflammation is being locked into the, into the on position for a really long period of time. And then the downstream effects of the body having to use nutrition and energy to uh, facilitate this reaction makes it almost uh, locked in itself and it just feeds on itself and, and, and keeps going. And we're gonna, the other two journals will we'll talk about mitochondria and the complement immune system just briefly. Um, these findings indicate the serotonin turnover is enhanced by a during viral inflammation. And now this isn't just COVID alone, but other viruses can also create a uh, serotonin turnover issue and, and uh, defective uh, ability of the platelets to carry serotonin. So the serotonin reduction impairs vagal signaling and memory function. In a symptom questionnaire administered at the time of blood draw, the majority of patients in our cohort reported fatigue. So chronic fatigue, mitochondrial issue and inflammation due to mitochondrial defect and energy production within the cell, cognitive difficulties due to the decreased serotonin and chronic inflammation, headache, loss of endurance, again, not making the ATP because tryptophan is a precursor, and we're going to get into that, uh, precursor to uh, NAD. NAD is the oxidized form of NADH. NADH is what supplies the first electron in the electron transport chain to make energy ATP. So if there's a defect there, you're not going to make the energy molecule ATP within the mitochondria. Uh, problems with sleep, again, serotonin is the precursor to melatonin. Anxiety and memory loss due to vagal nerve issue serotonin uh, and effects in the brain. Now, serotonin levels in the brain were un, uh, unaffected by the viral inflammation, suggesting that the peripheral reduction of serotonin was responsible for the cognitive impairment. Circu so 95% of the serotonin that we have circulating in our body is produced in the gut. This does not cross the blood-brain barrier. 5% is produced in the brain. The, it, the viral infection did not affect brain level, but the circulating serotonin um, can influence the brain via afferent sensory neurons. So remember the vagus nerve and the nerves going to the brain uh, uh, account for 80 to 85% of the information of the world within us and around us, sending information to the brain. It does need serotonin. You diminish that the tone is lessened, the body is unaware of what's happening within itself and around itself and cannot respond correctly. So we definitely need to get that handled. Gut is the biggie. We're gonna go over some, some uh, research on that. So serotonin depletion causes cognitive impairment through reduced sensory neuron activity. Consequently, here's the, the, the neat little pearl in this. Um, Consistently, restoration of peripheral serotonin levels using 5-hydroxytryptophan, basically a readily available within health food stores or on Amazon, restored uh, cognition. And it restored the, uh, helped to restore also the peripheral serotonin levels within the platelets. That's kind of neat. Uh, serotonin reduction dampens vagal signaling and thereby impairs cognitive function. And um, that's it. Oh, we got a little bit more that showed up. Now, I'll just go through this real quick. This is just to recap. The emergence of long COVID poses a global health challenge. The pathophysiology of post-viral syndromes remain poorly understood, uh, leaving medical systems across the world unprepared for the large number of individuals developing cardiorespiratory, neurocognitive, gastrointestinal, and musculoskeletal symptoms in the months and years following acute COVID. 
we show that um, viral inflammation driven serotonin depletion can be caused by a reduction of tryptophan absorption, reduced platelet count, and increased uh, monoamine oxidized expression, degrading the serotonin. Results in decreased vagal and hippocampal activation. Remember, hippocampal is memory, as well as cognitive impairment. Numerous studies have provided evidence for the presence of viral components and persistently high levels of type 1 interference in the blood eight months after infection. Our data, and remember, most studies take a long time to come to publish. And so eight months after infection, we're getting some of the first studies coming back. I'm sure that within a year to two years of now, they're going to find this going on years after the fact. Our data indicate that the presence of viral components and resultant interferon response might be a causative factor in the development of uh, long COVID associated symptoms. While we focused on serotonin in this study, tryptophan serves as the precursor for many other important metabolites, including niacin, B3, nerve conduction velocity, um, many other areas. I could get into a whole lecture just on niacin. NAD, oxidized form of a, or sorry, reduced form of oxidized form of NADH and um, then that that then feeds the NADH, which is in the cytochrome one in the mitochondria, which then leads to the production of any uh, ATP and melatonin. So melatonin is our one of our most powerful intercellular antioxidants, especially within the mitochondria. Diminish mitochond diminished melatonin then can affect sleep and lead to overall oxidative stress, which then is the precursor to just about every disease and aging that we can experience. Uh, third, a common feature of both acute and uh, post-acute SARS infection is the formation of microthrombi as a result of hypercoagulability. So microthrombi, I am seeing, like I mentioned before, a lot of, way more than I've ever experienced in my practice before. And you could imagine if this is in the tiniest capillaries, which are one red blood cell in diameter and actually even smaller in the double concave of the white red blood cell has to even squeeze down. You throw a little microthrombi in these capillaries, you develop poor circulation, they release, they can have detrimental downstream uh, effects. Our findings imply that thrombocytopenia or, de or decreased platelet uh, levels may diminish the carrying capacity of the systemic circulation for serotonin, reduce serotonin storage coupled with the uh, induction of that MAO serotonin degrading enzyme, may enhance the turnover of serotonin and excretion of the degradation products. Thus, hypercoagulability in acute COVID and long COVID may have implications beyond its cardiovascular system. And it does, and I am seeing it. Uh, Side note, I had a patient who actually came in with acute blindness, probably, I'm going to say 80, 75, 80% blindness, acute, one day fine, one day blindness, and diabetes with an A1C at 10. No diabetes, A1C at 10, unheard of. A1C is, is a long-term marker of what's called glycosylated end products of how the body metabolizes sugar, usually, let's say, a 90-day window, having normally ranges anywhere between athlete high fours to five, 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 six and above can be a pre-diabetes. This woman went from normal to 10 in, in a heartbeat. Unheard of. Um Fourth, our study indicates a role for the vagus nerve in mediating the impact of serotonin reduction on the brain. And lastly, finally, our findings indicate possible targets for clinical interventions uh, aimed at the pre prevention and the treatment of long COVID. Our animals demonstrate that serotonin levels can be restored and memory impairment reversed by precursor supplementation of 5-hydroxytryptophan, not tryptophan, 5-hydroxytryptophan. Okay, really quick, and this, we will be done here in a minute. 
Biomarker discovered boosts long COVID prediction accuracy by almost 80%. Studies have shown that long COVID has a significant detrimental effect on daily routines and the overall quality of life of affected individuals resulting in national scale work leave and socioeconomic loss. Research has estimated that between 41 and 45%, say 50%, of all COVID-19 patients experience some form of long COVID with global estimates at 13, 313 million patients, more than 40% of the patients report symptoms persisting for two years or more. Most people have decreased mitochondrial function and experience oxidative stress to begin with. High sugar, ultra processed foods, lack of vitamin D, lack of exercise, uh, defying circadian biology, artificial light at night, all have an impact on this. Then you add COVID to the mix, you just push the person over the tipping point. That's why we're seeing this. COVID is a bad guy, but it wouldn't be the bad guy if people actually took care of themselves, okay? just to sh just this this data came out november 1st yesterday um now conclusions in the present preprint uh preprint researchers verified hypotheses of long COVID associated inflammatory response arising due to complement system dysregulation so when they measure cd3 cd4 all the complement uh markers, there is dysregulation. This is an immune response left in the, they turned the car on, they broke the key, and they left this response turned on. If the body doesn't have a competent immune system due to low levels of vitamin D, due to low sun exposure, they are creating the oxidative stress by consuming ultra processed foods, experiencing circadian uh, uh, disruption due to long hours of artificial light at night and not being part of the circadian biology of seeing the sunrises, experiencing morning sun and using false light at night, which also affects the melatonin, the serotonin melatonin within their body. They're, it's called CAMPs, canthalacid antimicrobial peptides, which is a huge part of our immune system that is, that is activated through vitamin D and UVB exposure. Most people don't have that. The average vitamin D I see in my practice is 33 or below, 33. The cutoff is, is 30 on most uh, labs. We need to be at 100. At 100, the chances of developing disease practically goes down to zero. If you live long enough, you're going to get something, but at 100, the chances of the body just creating it on its own is extremely, extremely low. And just for kicks, I'm just going to throw this up. This is a graph of solar radiation index and cancer mortality per 100,000. Here we have Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Wyoming, because I don't know the elevation of Wyoming, but once you get above 5,000 feet, you're making vitamin D all year round or having UVB exposure all year round. They're getting 60 to 80 deaths per, uh, and this is a white population of cancer mortality per 100,000. The lowest, highest at 160, more than double, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, New York, Rhode Island, Washington, Minnesota, Vermont, Oregon, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware. So you can see that as we move to a more northerly latitude, we have less vitamin D exposure on a year round basis. So the cancer mortality rate is increased. I would I would be able to pull up, but when I'm not going to cancer incident incidents, autoimmune incidents, as well as mortality and severity. And this graph could almost overlay identically to that. So lower rates of cancer, autoimmune disease, as well as severity and mortality 
increase the further you go north and decrease the more southerly latitude. And this is the United States. As you move closer to the equator, it gets even better when you get into uh, uh, Ireland, England, Finland, Norway, especially within autoimmune diseases, those levels just increase even more. Now, this last study, uh, study reveals how COVID alters mitochondria, and this just came out October 31st, leading to energy outages and organ failure. When the mitochondria fail completely, you're dead. To the degree you have mitochondrial failure is to the degree you age and have disease and have an extremely poor quality of life. Uh, we found that at peak infection time, there are distinct changes in different regions of the brain, inclu including is a large decrease in mitochondrial genes in the cerebellum, the br uh, part of the brain that controls our muscles, balance, cognition, and emotion, the lung is the primary site of infection, but molecular signals are being transmitted, affecting the entire body with the heart, kidney, and liver being the most or more affected than uh, other organs, even long after the virus is gone. Uh, using a nasal swab and autopsy tissues from affected pa uh, patients the anim and animal models, researchers found that the virus blocks specific genes that use oxygen to create ATP energy, forcing the body to deplete finite energy reserves in the body. Most of my patients as well, when I measure bicarbonate levels in the blood, uh, the, the lower those CO2 levels, it's associated with metabolic acidosis, decreased oxygen carrying capacity, increased risk of sepsis, septic shock. Also increased risk of disease and severity of disease if you get a disease. Uh, without an energy source, cells throughout the body begin to starve because they're, they need ATP. We eat food to give us hydrogens to supply the mitochondria to use to make ATP energy, as well as donating uh, phosphorus and supplying manganese, copper, magnesium, things like that. Um, to keep the body functioning, cardiac and neural cells can resort to consuming their cellular parts. It's a last ditch effort, including their mitochondria. Eventually the cells are deprived of their vital elements and initiate a form of programmed cell death called neck necrotosis, necrotosis. Unlike other forms of cellular, cellular death like uh, mitophagy and autophagy or apoptosis, necrotosis causes a cascade of ill effects, including a robust inflammatory response, which releases pro-inflammatory cells called cytokines, uh, should say probably pro-inflammatory uh, chemical compounds or proteins called cytokines throughout the body as the cell ruptures. Uncontrolled necrotopsis further enhances sepsis. Sepsis is the number one cause of death in a hospital setting. You, you don't want to get sepsis in a hospital. Um, the ensuing cell death and inflammation may explain why patients with long COVID are likely to have persisting cardiovascular, cognitive, and inflammatory side effects after the initial infection has run its course. Last paragraph, the new findings also highlight new ways to address the mitochondrial dysfunction and, uh, that occurs during COVID infection. Diet, removing ultra-processed foods, following a more carnivore paleo, uh, diet, moving away from glycolysis, moving into ketosis has been shown to have an incredible effect on the body and with use for long COVID. Um, exercise, so weight training to basically stimulate tes testosterone growth hormone, mitochondrial, increase mitochondrial density to, to make up for the loss of mitochondria. We're going to create new mitochondria, natural compounds. We're going to get into in a second or a combination of the three, always a combination of three add in there, daily sunlight, uh, sun exposure, removing artificial light at night. If a person feels up to it, adding some cardio or high intensity interval training to the mix, removing uh, 
stress from your life by not watching the the news and getting rid of as much stressful people and experiences in your life to decrease the need for extra excess serotonin so at least if you can't make it you're re you're removing the reasons why you would need it um and uh, th so that may be able to stimulate mitochondrial function but whether or not they are effective for patients with long COVID is yet to be known I know it can be effective. So one of the things that, that I, now this, I'm going to just gloss over uh, quickly. This is a product called Tudka, T-U-D-C-A. There's an amino acid called taurine. When something binds to something else, we call it a conjugate. So it's taurine being bound to uh, a bile acid or bile, and so we call it a conjugated bile acid, Tudka. And obesity, stroke, now, now kind of think of just all the things we talked about, micro uh, clotting, ability of our lack of vagal tone and serotonin affecting how we perceive fullness could affect obese, obesity or even weight loss, acute myocardial inf infarction, spinal cord injury, which we're not, we has nothing really to do with, with COVID other than viruses affecting the uh, peripheral and central nervous system. Sorry, the spinal cord is part of that central nervous system and a long list of acute and chronic non-liver diseases associated with apoptosis or, or cell death are all potential therapeutic targets for Tudka. A growing number of preclinical pre and clinical studies underscore the potential benefit of this simple, naturally occurring bile acid, uh, which has been used in Chinese medicine for more than 3,000 years. I'm just gonna just gloss over a lot of this. Tudka acts as a mitochondrial stabilizer. So in, in functional medicine in in allopathic medicine they'll treat a symptom if you have issues with histamine i'm going to give you an antihistamine i am going to block that histamine reaction in nature within the body we can use natural products for, for instance that are called mast cell which then releases the histamine mast cell stabilizers vitamin c Quercetin are mast cell stabilizers. If we can stabilize the mitochondria, it takes more of the thing to create the problem. So if I can stabilize the mast cell, it's harder to release the histamine. And also it takes more stimulus for the cell to recognize it actually needs to release the histamine. So mitochondrial stabilizers, mitochondrial activators, uh, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis promoters. Those are the things that we're looking at. Uh, energy molecules within the mitochondria are things that we're looking at. So it's a mitochondrial sta stabilizer, anti-apoptotic agent in several models of neurodegenerative disease, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's diseases. Chronic degenerative neuro, uh, chronic neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, progressive fatal uh, 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 genetic neurodegenerative disorder. Ted has been shown to ameliorate a number of retinal disorders or ocular disorders. Stroke, Tudka has been shown to exert neuroprotective effects in rodent models of ischemic brain injury, stroke. So it's neuroprotective, diabetes, sub, and again, that patient that had diabetes, again, because it was a pan means all over, you know, uh, a pandemic around the entire world as far as uh, instead of an epidemic, which would be, let's say in the United States, pan epidemic would be around the world. So pan mitochondrial failure led to that patient's diabetes and blindness. Tudka theoretically 
may have been something that protected her. But after the fact, we never want to work after the fact. After the fact does not work. After the fact of, of stage four cancer does not work. Preventative works after the fact does not work. Pretreatment always works 99% more effectively than waiting till something actually occurs. Um, several reports confirm the ability of TEDCA to improve the uh, improve the hypoglycemia associated with both types of diabetes, type 1 and 2. In vivo, so in real life, uh, tissues were tested with TEDCA and insulin sensitivity increased 30%. That's huge in the body, 30%. Uh, TEDCA also restored impairment of islet and insulin secretion. So islet cells produce insulin within the pancreas uh, by reducing endoplasmic reticulum stress. So when there's stress inside the cell, oxidative stress, they just, it, these organelles can't work properly. Uh, Tudkin pig islets also increase ATP content. So the ATP within these cells, so the mitochondria is actually generating more ATP. They were functioning more efficiently. So it was helping to, uh, uh, repair, regenerate, or protect. Obesity, TED could led to a decrease in cardiac hypertrophy, decrease hypertension, blood pressure, and normalization of cardiac uh, uh, contractility. Cardiovascular disease, TED could can promote cardio protection. So again, protection. Protection is, is the key. Prevention is the key. Treatment is not the key. Prevention is the key. Uh, gastrointestinal tract, Tudka has been used in the treat to treat experimental gastrointestinal tract disorders. So inflammatory bowel disease, the worst of the worst, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease has been able to help that. Uh, renal injury, so acute uh, kidney issue, either due to ischemia lack of uh, oxygen to the organ of reperfusion. So if there was an issue that decreased oxygen, it was denied it and then actually was restored, that actually can create bad problems. This helped protect it. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop sharing screen here. So Dick, Dixie, I am, if you can, because you're going to be on YouTube video if you want to be on YouTube video because it's going to be on YouTube. So why don't you just unshare your screen just for a minute? Um, now, other things that have been researched, and this will make sense, creatine monohydrate. Creatine has been in the bodybuilding uh, arena forever, sports enhancement. It's been incredibly well studied and safe. Creatine binds to phosphate. It's pulled into the mitochondria. It's a phosphate donor. The mitochondria use it to make adenosine triphosphate. So it actually acts as an, a mitochondrial energy molecule. Other things that have been uh, researched, and we're not going to get into just for, for sake of time, other journals using uh, things like natokinase, seropeptase, and lumbokinase, uh, they are, they help degrade protein, clots, inflammation, which is, is protein. Uh, natokinase has been the one that studies have, have reflected to the most. And the use of uh, bromelain, another natural proteolytic enzyme, dandelion, which has been used for thousands of years, and then 5-hydroxytryptophan that we mentioned. So research so far for long COVID, uh, just long COVID has looked at uh, creatine monohydrate, 5-HTP, dandelion extract, natokinase, and bromelain. There are more and then as far as what I've read, as far as uh, COVID research on its own, B-complex, NAC, selenium, taurine to reduce oxidative uh, stress, along with vitamin D, I will always prefer sun exposure, but research has shown that as minimum as minimal amount as 2000 IUs a day can raise somebody's uh, vitamin D levels to above 30 
to 50. And there is a, a, a gene that 50% of patients who have cancer have this particular gene. And people who have this gene have, it's been shown that just even giving them 2000 IUs of vitamin D is reducing their, their risk of fatality by 20 to 30%. So vitamin D is extremely important. The sun will always, because it, of the, the, the near infrared, far, mid, UVA, UVB, visible light, will always be more effective than the synthetic. And then when we could add in uh, exercise and uh, a protein rich diet donating nitrogens to help create nitri nitric oxide, a signaling molecule, peripheral vasodilator from, and it's activated by ultraviolet A light. All of those things can help to protect the body. They're, they're simple. The research is out there. I'm gonna post the links to the journals that we went over today on the uh, on the link in YouTube. And I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Any questions, please post them in the comment section. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe. All right, have a great day. And we got us.